Super soldiers. Everyone loves them. How could you not? The Space Marines, the Spartans, hell, Captain America, they're all popular for a reason. But when you think of these guys, you probably think of the bombastic, massive battles they're all a part of. I mean, sure, the Spartans were designed for counter-terror ops and were frequently deployed to some covert ops stuff during the Human Covenant War, and the Raven Guard certainly exist, but you usually don't think of them doing this stuff, or at least I don't. I think of the Space Marines fighting off against entire high fleets and Black Crusades, or Noble Team fighting against an entire Covenant army at the head of the UNSC forces. Not exactly low-profile military operations. But while the gentlemen of today's video aren't quite super soldiers, I definitely think of them as such. They certainly killed enough droids to qualify. Early 2000s Star Wars video games were just built different. Aside from pure nostalgia, they were often just plain good. And one of them introduced many people to one of the best pieces of Star Wars lore ever, the Clone Command. Because to win a war, you need more than the grunts and the generals to secure victory. Sometimes someone has to go behind enemy lines and assassinate a politician. Probably deservedly, all politicians are evil, but putting that aside, I want to go on a nostalgia trip today. So with that in mind, let's take a journey to a galaxy far, far away and listen as I dredge up childhood memories about the Republic's knives in the dark. Is it only about Delta Squad? No, but mostly about Delta Squad. There's some cool folks. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there's some stuff that the clone commandos probably had to make sure they knew before going into battle. Stuff like math, science, data analysis. You might think that's a bit silly to say, but consider this. If you're a super soldier in a sci-fi universe, you gotta have at least a passing knowledge of space travel, right? And you know what you need to know how that stuff works? Math, and a whole lot of it. So if you want to be just exactly like a Star Wars super soldier, then have I got the thing for you, because this video is sponsored by Brilliant. Now let me tell you something about myself. I am absolute garbage at math. And when I say garbage, I don't mean that I'm just a bit rusty. I mean that in college, the only math course I took started with a professor drawing a square on the board and talking about shapes. I got a B minus, and to this day, I'm not sure how I even pulled that off. So yeah, I'm not exactly Albert Einstein over here. Thankfully, Brilliant is happy to start on my level, and has math courses for every level of skill he can think of. I started off with variables and pre-algebra, and everything is genuinely easy to use and understand. It's great for visual learning, because Brilliant gives you an image of what the problem you're working on looks like. Let me practice some beginner math, and if I ever got stuck, the option is always there to give an explanation on what exactly you're working on. Once again, though, like I said, Brilliant's courses are available for all levels of mathematical expertise, not just those of us who considered math class as an obstacle to history class when we were 16 and are now paying the price for it. For the first time in over half a decade, I actually felt like I could do a math problem beyond basic addition, and it's very flexible with how you use it. There's no penalties for not doing lessons in a certain amount of time. It's designed to help you, after all, not recreate a classroom one-to-one. -one. There's a cool feature that gives you bonus points for repeated days in a row of lesson taking, but the CEO of Brilliant isn't going to mail home a report card to your parents because you were a bit too busy one day to log in. It's suitable for everyone because of that. Maybe you're like me and want to brush up on math skills a bit because it's just a good thing to know. Maybe you're a student yourself and need the extra practice. Brilliant is the best way to help both of us learn. And again, it isn't just basic math. Computer science, data science, very important stuff, what with all the AI technology breakthroughs lately. If you want to make sure you stay one step ahead, Brilliant is perfect for you on this, too. Even better, though, my audience of primarily war gamers, you know what you're doing in your head when you're quickly thinking of the chances of your squad of guardsmen hitting and wounding a squad of fire warriors? Math. And you know what Brilliant is designed to help you get better at? Math. So Brilliant isn't just for academic and workplace matters. It might damn well make you a better war gamer too. Ain't that something. But I know that above all else, money talks. So how about this? You can not only get the first 30 days of Brilliant as a free trial, but 20% off an annual plan if you use my link in the description, which is also plastered in your face on the screen right now. And just to make sure you don't miss it, I'll spell it out for you too. That's brilliant.org slash pancreas no work slash to get a 30 free day trial and 20% off an annual plan. I may be a YouTuber now, but I was a teacher before, so trust me when I say that Brilliant is legitimately a great website to help you learn and well worth the price. And even if you decide not, you've got 30 days to really make sure of it. Offer is only available for the first 200 people to use the link, so try Brilliant today and make sure you never stop learning. Alright, let's talk about some commandos. Clone commandos, which I will intermittently call Republic commandos instead because really what's the difference, were a specially created force of clone soldiers designed to go above and beyond the average trooper. Now, as with anything in Star Wars that exists in both Legends and the new canon, they have multiple different backstories and whatnot, so I'll try to say when I'm covering something with Legends versus something with new canon lore. If I think both versions could theoretically exist at the same time without conflict, then I'll just say both things happened. All that being said, their legend's origin is way cooler. Apparently in the new canon, it was just some Kaminoan going, hey, we need some better clones, let's make these guys. 
A valid reason, to be fair, but not the most interesting. But in Legends, Jango Fett was a smart man and knew that for a whole-ass galactic war, you needed more than just the grunts on the front line. So he grabbed some standouts from the clones and trained them as ARC Troopers, those badass guys from the original Clone Wars cartoon. The Kaminoans, however, were skeptical of this, and because of the additional fact of ARC Troopers all being loose cannons who don't play by the book, they created their own special troops, the Clone Commandos. In the eyes of Kamino, the Clone Commandos are about as perfect as you were going to get when it comes to the balance between ARC Troopers and regular clones. They weren't quite as rebellious and independent as the ARC Troopers, but they were independent enough to be able to come up with their own strategies and ways to complete the mission. While Jango didn't train them, he had 100 hand-picked soldiers of whom three quarters were Mandalorians do so, so you can rest easy knowing these guys still had the best training available. They were put into groups of four and put through live fire exercises in which not all of them survived. What came out at the other end of the training was a batch of already battle-hardened soldiers who would work together so well you'd think they were mentally linked. Well, perhaps an ARC Trooper could take a singular commando in a fight, a squad of ARCs versus a squad of commandos would result in a squad of dead ARC troopers. You know what? Nah, I'm not gonna pretend I'm unbiased. Commandos would body ARCs. Fight me on it. Something that sets them apart from almost every other special soldier archetype in fiction is that you can see just about every step of their training, not just hear or read about it. You can see them in the growth pods where the commandos, boss in particular, are specifically stated as just being better than the average clone. You can see them presumably learning tactics and all sorts of useful stuff as children, and see what it looks like in their combat simulations where they put their learned skills to the test. It's some very cool stuff. Republic Commando is a very cool game, what can I say? As with the rest of their brothers, they were kept on Kamino until the Battle of Geonosis. Interestingly enough, despite Geonosis being the first battle of the Clone Wars, it would seem the Commandos had already gathered quite the reputation for themselves. As this one guy puts it, Who knows, maybe Boss pulled a Master Chief off-screen and massacred four ARC troopers in a gym or something. As an aside, they have the single greatest theme ever conceived. The Ultramarines chant from Chaos Gate is cool, the Halo theme is legendary, but nothing to me hits the same chord as Vodayan. Brothers all. I mean, how can anything equal this? I take back what I said about the tip of the spear cutscene from Halo Reach. This is the coolest video game cutscene ever conceived. I can recite this and most of Vodayan by heart at this point. I've played the game so often it's burned into my memory. Vodayan is in Mandalorian if you didn't know that, by the way. Just replace Coruscant with Mandalore in the song and you've got a Mando War song. It also calls the Commandos the Wrath of Coruscant, which holy shit, that is the best thing ever. I learned that while I was writing this script and I really hope I'm bringing across how much my inner child is smiling right now. Fittingly enough, some of the clone commandos were big fans of Mandalorian culture and saw it as a sort of heritage for themselves. This earned them some enmity from their brothers later on as the Republic fought Mandalore, and as the clones were bred to be completely loyal to the Republic, they looked on on anything relating to the Mandalorians with disgust. Of course, the commandos were still loyal to the Republic. Between the neural chip of new canon and them just being bred that way in Legends, they were loyal through and through. But the Mandalorian culture, and admittedly some jealousy, made sure that the clone commandos weren't respected by every trooper. Just most of them. Their premiere was, of course, on the Battle of Geonosis. Master Window had five squads deployed with him to battle, who naturally had them engage in a full frontal assault against the droid army. Don't know why he was given a unit of specialized commandos and told them to bull rush the front lines, but that does sound like something Windu would do. Like how his reaction to Palpatine being discovered as Darth Sidious was to immediately march in there with three other Jedi instead of 500, or just blowing his office up from orbit or something. Yeah, I know that would have been a tremendous war crime on the Republic's capital world. He's a Sith Lord, that's the kind of enemy you break out the war crimes for. But that aside, almost 5,000 commandos died on Geonosis. For fuck's sake, Jedi, it is not hard to figure out how to use the commandos. Regular clones charge headfirst into gun emplacements, the clone commandos go behind enemy lines and ensure that the guns aren't firing at the regular clones. Of course, the most interesting action the commandos took on Geonosis, and the one you're most likely familiar with, is the Delta Squad murdering of a Geonosian politician. Sun Fak, the chief lieutenant of the Chief Geonosian, whose name I don't feel like saying because it feels like I'm having a glup shit moment just by thinking about him, was the target of an assassination mission by Delta Squad. Them not only being badass but the protagonist of a first-person shooter, they put Sun Fak in the ground by shooting him out of the sky. They blow up a droid factory that another commando squad nearly died to a man failing to do, and then they get evac'd by a gunship while the factory blows up around them. I'm pretty sure they also murder enough Geonosian infants to put the entire species at risk of extinction. 
At least they did when I played them, because when I was six years old, all I knew was that their eggs were gross and bothered me. Now that I'm older, I still hold that opinion, only with the added bonus of me knowing that I'm probably a monster for doing what I'm doing, and I just don't care. Frankly, I find the idea of a bug that thinks offensive, so I don't feel like I'm in the wrong. With the Battle of Geonosis wrapped up, the Commandos then went to do what they do best across the galaxy. Now a lot of what these gents were up to is just straight up the plot of either episodes of the Clone Wars, books, or the Republic Commando game. So I'll keep things brief, and you can go off and find what I'm talking about if you're interested. In the name of being completely honest, it'll also be mostly Delta Squad, both because I feel like they're THE Commando Squad and know what they're all about, and because they're a solid 40% of the nostalgia of my childhood. They did a ton of different stuff, so it'll be a good way to show just how versatile and diverse the Commando's skill sets truly were. After Geonosis, Delta Squad's cleared an entire acclimator ship of droids, and so in a command thought that Scorch was excellent, which made at least two people that thought that. After that, they helped save the lives of another group of commandos, Omega Squad. During the course of this rescue, Sev nearly beat the shit out of one of the commandos of Omega Squad named Adden, because they apparently had the same trainer when they were still baby commandos, and that just set Sev off. Omega Squad got to reunite with their Jedi best friend, and Delta Squad sat in the corner and talked amongst themselves. Way to go, Sev. You ruined the party for everyone. Who am I kidding? He doesn't give a shit. Speaking of their former trainer, Delta Squad helped him rob a bank. In preparation for the invasion of Mygito, also known as the planet where Big Forehead gets obliterated on, Delta Squad was sabotaging key sites and generally preparing for the battle proper. Their trainer, Wolin Vow, happened to be there on a personal quest of his. Said personal quest, for whatever reason or other, was robbing a bank. I mean, I get it. In the quest to get more money, a successful bank heist is certainly that. And Star Wars isn't just one planet where you can get extradited to another country on it. If he just fucked off to the Outer Rim, he'd basically be free of any form of retribution. Unfortunately for his retirement plans, he fell into the icy caverns below the surface, but despite commanding Delta Squad to leave him behind, they get permission from the people in charge and return to rescue him. But more importantly than anything else, Delta Squad's final mission to Kashyyyk before the Clone Wars ended. And please hold on to your seats, everyone, because because I have perhaps the greatest news to share with you of all. If you've played Republic Commando, you know what happens. Delta Squad is sent to rescue the Wookiee Chieftain Tarful, and in the process nearly blew General Grievous' head to clean off his stupid semi-robotic face. What also happens in the game, and Legends canon, is that Delta Squad completely secures the landing areas at Kashyyyk to allow the battle scene in Revenge of the Sith to occur. That's right, everyone. It was the clone commandos of Delta Squad who allowed for the Republic to even begin an effective staging ground for the Battle of Kashyyyk. But as they blow a Separatist cruiser out of the damn sky, Sev comes under assault by hostiles. The game ends as Delta Squad goes to rescue Sev before being pulled back by direct command from Yoda himself, and this is the most unforgivable sin I can possibly think of that damn frog doing. Oh, I'm sorry, Yoda. Was that clone commando not worth saving? The one who allowed you to set foot in the planet to begin with? You corrupt, useless waste of a Jedi Master? Fuck you, you piece of shit. Dagobah was too good for you. You should have been exiled to that goddamn black hole with the HP Lovecraft monster inside of it. Ahem. Pardon me, that was some childhood anger escaping into the video. I said I had good news, and it comes in the form of one of the few changes Disney made to the canon I wholeheartedly support. Because while there is mention of a clone commando squad rescuing Tarful, and it's safe to assume that it was none other than the Deltas doing it, there's no explicit mention of Delta Squad being the ones to carry it out. While this may sound bad, because you can take it as Disney erasing a cool moment from canon for no real reason, it also means that Sev's death is no longer canonical. And, since most of Delta Squad hasn't been seen in shows like The Bad Batch recently, it's not all that unreasonable to assume that Sev still lives. His death being confirmed by his absence doesn't mean anything on account of Fixer and Boss also not being shown. So rejoice everyone, for the galaxy's most bloodthirsty special ops soldier may still be out there taking names. Before I move on, there's also Gregor. Gregor is cool. I could go on about Gregor for a paragraph or 20, but here's the great thing about him. You can just watch an episode of The Clone Wars. Don't have to play a whole game or read a whole book. Just watch a 22-minute Clone Wars episode to see just how goddamn cool the Commandos can be. Go watch it, or at the very least just look up the action scene on YouTube. That's all this section serves to do, just go watch Gregor kill like a thousand droids by himself. Now. But we all know what ends up happening with the clone troopers in Star Wars. They get some funny ideas in their head about what the Republic should look like, and whether or not any Jedi should be in it. Which is to say, it shouldn't be a Republic any longer, and there should be zero Jedi in it. So things, uh, they get a bit wacky for all the clone troopers. 
a little bit of gunning down your commanding officers in the Grand Army of the Republic, that kind of wacky. While in Legends there were of course a few deserters, in New Canon the brain chips ensure that just about every one of the commandos did as the rest of the clones did and gunned the Jedi down with gusto. Alongside Gregor once again being a kick-ass amnesiac, the only commandos who didn't go along with Order 66 were the Bad Batch, some commandos that were, shall we say, an interesting bunch. Most of their brain chips didn't work, although they did cause the Bad Batch to suffer some headaches, which certainly gave Captain Rex a hell of a scare. I won't talk much about them, since not only are they in a TV show you can watch, I haven't seen the Bad Batch yet. Although in saying that, I know Scorch makes an appearance, and let me just say something, that's not Scorch. Maybe he's got the same color scheme as Scorch, and is listed as Scorch, but it isn't him, and I know that for certain because of two reasons. For one, he doesn't sound like Scorch. For two, he did not use nearly enough explosives against the Bad Batch for me to be comfortable accepting that Scorch. Scorch. If it really was him, the entire facility would have had its architecture rearranged. As for the majority of the commandos though, including not Scorch, they were to train the first generation of stormtroopers. They're called Imperial Commandos from this point forward instead of Republic Commandos, but same difference really, come on. This is true in both Legends and Canon, although in Legends they had some extra stuff on top of that to deal with. The remaining clone commandos and arc troopers were brought into the 501st, Vader's own legion, and were thus placed directly under his control. Even more than the 501st already was acting in this capacity, these special forces were specifically given the duty of hunting down and exterminating both any surviving Jedi and any clones who decided to order 66 was a load of shit. Grim work, undoubtedly, but the surviving commandos carried through with utmost efficiency. And with that, the lore of the commandos just kind of ends, or at least what I can find does. If I had to take a guess, I imagine they have a pretty expected conclusion to their lore. As the Empire moves away from clones, the commandos are gradually phased out through a mixture of them dying, being replaced with non-clones, or even just aging beyond their ability to serve. To wrap up, I'm just going to talk about their equipment. What lets the commando do the awesome things they do? Well, let's talk about it. They all wear Katarn-class commando armor, which is not only highly customizable, but comes in with built-in deflector shields to make sure the commandos can take a hit and keep going. If that isn't enough, the suit is also designed to be extremely easy to administer Bacta to the wearer. Rule 39, ladies and gentlemen, never say no to the stuff. It's got built-in lights, communication systems, a filter slash vacuum seal, night vision, and is all around probably the best armor a normal person could possibly want to wear if it was real. Yeah, everyone wants to either be a Spartan or a Space Marine, but consider that Mjolnir armor would snap your spine in half with the reflex enhancers it has for the former, and odds are good that you're not a 7 foot tall living fridge for the latter. The thing also has a built in vibro blade inside of it. While in new canon they've been a bit nerfed, if memory serves correctly in Legends they were capable of fighting against lightsabers. Granted in the Old Republic where this is best seen it's because they had cortosis as a part of their makeup, but the point still stands that if you want something dead and don't have a gun to hand, this thing's gonna cut through just about anything. Times have changed after all Jedi, so take your elegant weapons and shove them where the twin suns don't shine. So their armor is fantastic, but how about their weapons? Buckle up, because they've got one hell of an arsenal. They're armed with a DC-17 blaster rifle, which can at any moment decide being a laser rifle isn't hardcore enough, and instead will be a sniper rifle or anti-armor weapon instead. The commandos were often deployed behind enemy lines for unspecified amounts of time, so it pays to make sure they can tackle any challenge thrown at them. There's also the DC-15 sidearm. It's a pistol. It recharges its own power cell, so it is canonically a weapon with infinite ammo, but it's still also just a pistol. It's fine, I haven't got much to say on it. Sidearms are good to have for a soldier, and that's the end of the discussion. Well, this is what the average commando can be expected to carry at any given moment, they're trained in just about every weapon you can imagine. Call it justification for you being able to expertly use whatever weapons you find in a Republic Commando if you really want to, but either way it means that even if you strip a commando of every weapon he has, he can grab anything he finds and use it with at least some level of proficiency. Overall, clone commandos are just awesome. I have nothing to qualify that sentence with either, they're just awesome. Speaking of awesome, you should watch the Shadow of the Republic short film on YouTube by Cinematic Captures. As far as I know, it's just a fan film, but this is exactly the kind of stuff I imagine the commandos were doing in the less savory missions they were assigned to. And yes, it has Vodayan played during it. They know what they were doing when they made a commando short. Thank you, as always, to my wonderful channel members. You are the clone commandos to my Republic, doing the quiet work that lets me keep on running efficiently. For a certain definition of the word efficiently. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Ha, ah, super battle droids aren't super, they get torn apart all the time. I don't know where they get their name from.